Congratulations to Northampton Saints, who secured the Gallagher Premiership title, overcoming 14-man bar. We are joined by winning back rower Tom Pearson to reflect on the final, before which myself and the economist debate England squad for the summer tour. Saints have done it. Congratulations. Um, if you're a Northampton fan, they held on against a resurgent 14 man bath on Saturday to claim the Gallagher Premiership final, their first in 10 years. We've got Tom Pearson dropping in in about 25 minutes or so. So we will be reviewing that final then. But first of all, myself and the troops, we're going to review England's summer squad, which was announced on Monday. Um, so the four of us are going to start by discussing that. Guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the final and we will get to that. But let's look at the squad. I think, first of all, I know we'll have our names that we want there. Some people have said it's a 50-50 squad. I think generally people are quite happy with the back line, but Brendan, I'll bring you in. For the most part, it's a pretty good looking squad. I think it's a very good squad. <laughs> it's uh, it's a representative squad. We're going down there fully booted and suited. Uh, it's a pretty fair representation of the talent in the English game at the moment. Uh, it's still a little bit of work in, in progress. You know, we hold our breath to see if they can recapture that little bit of magic they somehow conjured up towards the end of the Six Nations. I mean, I've only got very few minor quibbles, and uh, I'll spare uh, Tom Pearson's blushes. He's on later. As you know, I wanted him in the 22 tour squad to Australia on this podcast. I wanted him in the World Cup, and I would want him in this. I don't really get Ethan Roots. Um wholehearted player that he is. I don't really see what he brings to the table. But I suppose the thing with Tommy only had two games at the end of the season. There he had quite a long injury uh spell. And he's, you know, Tom Curry is Tom Curry. He comes in. If he's fit, he comes in. Tom hasn't Tom Pearson hasn't got that kudos yet. So I was a bit fearful that he wouldn't get in. Other than that, it's you know it's difficult to pick too many holes in that as far as I'm concerned. Um the proof of the pudding though will be how they play uh, and if they can re recapture that sort of uh, more exciting, fluid style we saw. Let's journey backwards before we go forwards. So the back line, I think the only two points of discussion for me are one, George Ford not being there. So let's start with that. Chewy, obviously, this is a chance for one of the Smiths to put their name in the hat. Who would be your starting 10? Presumably, it'll be Marcus for Japan since Finn was in that final, who would be your starting 10 for that first New Zealand test? Um, well, 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 you uh, imagine, if, you, if you're right about Marcus Smith playing, play, playing against the Japanese, which I'm um, likely to be the case, um, I mean, if he goes really well, then there's your, there's your, there's your chance. I mean, there, there's, your, there's your selection. I don't really see in a, in a three-test tour that you... Um, Unless Borthwick has very, very preconceived ideas of of who's going to play against the All Blacks in the first test, um, you imagine it will be Mark Smith if 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 the uh, the Japanese game goes really well. I I I I think it's I don't really have a sort of don't have a view because they're relatively. I mean, Finn Smith's very inexperienced in the in the England context, but he's come on leaps and bounds, hasn't he? I mean, I think they'll really miss Ford. I have to say that. I mean, he'd, he'd have been in my side to play the All Blacks all day long because the All Blacks are in transition. The one thing that isn't in transition about the All Blacks is the threat they pose in the back line. So you really don't want to be playing fast and loose with that lot. That's for sure. You want a very controlled game. Might not be that, uh, might not be that exhilarating, but you have to stop them playing. England did that in 2014 with that, that half a team. Um, for, you know, Freddie Burns played 10. They should have won the game. I mean, they lost it very late to a Comrade Smith try from memory. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to play fast and loose with an All Blacks back line that's always going to be dangerous. So you take them on up front and you play a territory possession game, the kind of thing the Springboks do. Um, yeah. Now, who's best suited to do that out of Finn Smith and Marcus Smith? The truth is probably neither of them is, is suited to it is George Ford, but George Ford ain't there. So I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's complete either or to me. So so you're really suggesting that they go back and play a territorial game, having you know played and found an attacking edge in the last two games, or actually att an attacking transformation. I don't think that they've got the firepower to play that sort of game. 
you know, to play a Springboks game against New Zealand. I think that New Zealand's pack is as strong as England's and actually on the evidence of the World Cup, probably stronger. So I'm... Uh, and well, they're, they're struggling at lock, Nick, for a start. They don't have Retallick. They don't have Whitelock. They've gone. And they have injuries there. Well, they've got Tui Pilotu, who's who's got about 25, 30 caps. Yeah, and he's about you know, 20%. And they've got, and about they've 20% got Scott Barrett, as good as Whitelock and Retallick. And, about he's, 20%. They've got Scott Barrett. And and my my reading of it is New Zealand always cry wolf before every test series regarding bloody injuries and so on and so forth. You get out there and you're facing the full, full Montezuma every every time. And so, viewers, there'll be a lot more of this through the summer because it doesn't <laughs> take Nick long. Oh. It doesn't take Nick long to get on the Kiwis case. Go on, yeah, Mesa. But, Go but on. you know, but it's more England's case that I'm on here because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm sort of thinking, OK, Alex Dombrandt hasn't had a bad season. I don't have a real issue with him being there. But Ted Hill not being in there, I've definitely got an issue about. You know, especially with Courtney Law's not there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, and and I look at um, just looking at the final. Um, I thought that E. Yogan was very unlucky to get penalised the first time round when he was up against Stewart, and then he turned it round, and he ha he had Stewart in trouble, and he is, you know, if Dan Cole in his 37th year, goes down with an injury of some sort or other, he's the next man in. Yeah. And then there's Joe Hayes behind him. Now, I know that you sort of had had a, uh, a, a jest at my, at my expense about my obsession with scrums and tight heads and so on and so forth in the last episode. But just look at the impact that Dutoy had. On a broken clock is still right twice a day, Nick. Yeah, yeah. On both sides of the scrum, <laughs> it bloody isn't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, for me, um, I just look at it and I think that front row wise, they are they're they're skating on pretty thin ice. And if they get injuries, which three test tour, you might you know you might sail through, but you might not. Yeah. And. Um, I don't I, think, I just don't I don't see, think they're I, running the All Blacks off the pitch, Nick. I, I, I don't. Think, I know. I, really I don't think don't that they think... can run them off the pitch, but I certainly think that they can play a game that you know that takes them on yeah. in, I, in in a running in a running sense. I don't think you can lock up against them that way. You do lose unless you're very very good at it, which I don't think England are. I don't well, think you pick that, six Northampton true. backs and then play at that the same sort of game. game. No. I think they've set their stall out here, for better or for worse. You know, they're going the Northampton way behind the scrum, and we'll see if it's enough, if it can translate to international rugby. Yeah, well, we, took, we saw what happened to that in the final. Well, exactly. There's a danger there, but they might have learned from the final a bit. But um, it, it, I think it's a, a very interesting tour. England are going to put it on the line, I think, and we'll see exactly how far this new new game can take them. But I think roots. I, I think you know you got to look at the looking at the selection more. You, you know more so. You've got to really look at roots. Roots has not done badly for England at all. He's a big, powerful guy. But to put him in ahead of Ted Hill on the basis of this season, I would say no. I would say that that shirt had to go to Hill. Yeah. So and, and these sorts of decisions are you know they're they're very important. Yeah. Ogre, I've always liked as a player. He's sort of come in in from the outer. I don't mind that with Langdon being injured. But, um, you know, I just look at it. Uh, you know, you're right. I mean, Charlie Ewells is not, in terms of modern locks, he, he'd been playing very well, incidentally. I'd, I'd, I'd preface everything by saying that. But in terms of modern locks, he is not a big man. No. You know, and so if you look at... Um, at Coles and uh, Ewells as your two backup locks. You've got two rangy, basically rangy locks. You haven't got a tractor lock in there outside Martin. I, I don't see why T Tiuma is not in there. Um, so there are, I've, I've got issues. And the Tom Curry thing is another issue. You know, you've got, I know Alex Anderson's going to protect his players and, you know, that's his job. But, you know, his point is quite a good one. The guys played no rugby. You know, he came in for what on for 25 minutes against Bath or half an hour against Bath. And he was, he was outstanding. 
you know, he was like a dog with, <laughs> well, anyway, he was outstanding when he came on. But to, to then project that forward and take him on the tour at the expense of somebody like our, our, our guest coming on, Tom Pearson, I don't understand. Doesn't make sense to me. Remember at the start when I said that it was a 50-50 squad for some people? I think we've just seen the 50 and the 50. <laughs> Brendan <laughs> saying it's very good and then Nick coming in off a medium run by Nick's standards. But I, I, I do think you're right. I think the sort of the abyss at tight head is, is very, very clear in that there's almost a divide in the pack as well because you've got the likes of Pearson, Barbary, Mercer, I know for other issues, Ted Hill missing out in the back row. Yeah. who are obviously well-established starters and all have hopefully big in international futures, whilst you've got Joe Hayes doesn't start for Leicester. Yeah. And he's in the England squad. So And Will Stewart doesn't start for Bath. But who's unlucky on the tight head side then? Well, it's a very good question. I think Davison possibly yeah, is unlucky because he can right. play both sides. We haven't got him, Nick, have we? We haven't no. got him. No, we're thin. We're really thin. There's no question about it. And and we've been thin since 2019, yeah, and before. So, anyway, um, look. As far as the backs are concerned, I, again, I look at scrum half. I think Harry Randall, yeah, very good season, but I look at him in test terms, and I look at the fact that they've they've blooded both Borthwick. Borthwick took it on from Eddie Jones uh, around Port Van Portfleet, and to a lesser extent, Quirk. Now, for one of them not to be in this uh, in this uh, setup, I find strange. I think Randall's played very well. Harem Scarum, very fast game. <clears throat> He's excellent, but physically, you look at you know you get small men, and then you get very small men. Now, Dupont is a small man, but incredibly, you know, I mean, he's a one-off, but incredibly physically strong. And I think that Randall is is in danger at, at test level of being swamped. But we'll see. We'll see. He could prove me wrong, and I, and I really hope he does. Because I, I, I like the idea of a game for all sa shapes and sizes. I, but, I think you know, cool. you've got, had two guys <clears throat> in Van Portfleet and, uh, and Quirk who've had their injuries, but who have been playing at the end of the season. And um, I'm quite surprised that one of them didn't get in. I, at the same token, I'm glad to see Spencer in there because I thought he's kicking. I'm going to say you can't pick any of those ahead of Spencer, can you? No. So it, it was a very third man. Well, yeah. Spen Spencer's selection is what, and and to a to a to an extent, Roots as well, suggested to me that it, they're not going to play like the Harlem Globetrotters out there. The, that you know they want they want the ball in front of a pack they want to play in the right areas of the field I mean I, I go back to the point where, where if you really if you really want a game of tag with the All Blacks you'll lose so you've got to do something else Ford I think is a blow that there was a preface to all of this if they really wanted to play the big All Court game the really big All Court game well enough to test the All Blacks then you would have had Ted Hill, wouldn't you? You would have had Zach Mercer, quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, no. those those types of players. I mean, I, I know Don Brandt does quite a lot of what Mercer does. And and he's 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 the footballing number eight that Borthwick prefers at the moment. But it does it does seem to be a slight there's a bit of a disconnect mm. between how they ended the Six Nations mm. and the selection for this. Well, you use the word all, all court, Chris. I, I think that that's the game that they've got to play. They've got to be good in the tight areas, which I've got. I'll be surprised if, if they are. But And they've also got to be able to play a running game too. They've got to be able to hurt them on their own terms. Yeah. And people like Freeban Freeman and Furbank can, can do that, for sure. Which until they sure. fell apart in uh, in the third test in 2014 is actually what they did to a degree. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, I mean, the people forget that is that that first test in particular, when England were forced to field almost a second string side because of, I think it was the Premiership final that limited. Yeah, yeah. Correct, if I'm wrong. Should have won it. 
they played an incredibly free flowing game of rugby with the likes of, I mean, Carl Eastman was at 12 and he tore up and they nearly got the job done. So I, I get what you're saying, Chewy, about they're not going to be playing like the Harlem Globe, Globe Trotters. How could they? But I think they've almost picked a pack for front football where you can imagine that the likes of Underhill, who was astonishing on Saturday, will be starting at seven. And, you know, the shed, the memories of the World Cup semi-final. And then from that front football, the likes of Freeman, Furbank, etc., can hopefully make hay. Yeah, back to his best, you know. And, and he, you know, when he's like that, he can be, you know, game game changing. And um, yeah, so got... I, I don't really remember in twenty in the in the twenty fourteen test, the Auckland test, that England played a particular. I mean, it was a weird game. Yeah, and that that was a very strong All Black side, hmm. but England England didn't score a try in that game. I don't think. No. Um, I think I think the only try in the game was Conrad Smith. Conrad Smith, yeah, you are right. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't think it was. I don't think it resembled New Zealand France in the '99 World Cup semi-final. It wasn't. It, it, it wasn't that joyous expression of the possibilities of rugby. It was just a weird game, and England scrapped, and the All Blacks were a bit off it, and 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 it went pretty much down to the wire. Wasn't that and, the? And then, in, game was then the in the second game. in the second test, England played pretty well in the first half and were scoring tries, and then it went it went belly up. In the, in, in the third quarter against the All Blacks, they put together a big lead. And then England got back to within a point. Yeah. And then the third test in Hamilton, that was when Andy Farrell said, I know what a good defensive performance looks like. And that wasn't it. Yeah. And and put it on Carl Eastman. Too. And put it all on Carl Eastman. <laughs> um, look, I, I I mean, wasn't the second test the two laggy um, long, yeah. long, long yeah. sprint? It was. And it was the Billy 12 trees offload that went wrong. Yeah. And just after half time, and the All Blacks ran in from distance, having who who hoovered up a loose offload. Yeah, well, that's the you know that's that's the, those are the dangers of playing the sort of game that England, as England found out against France and Lyon. Yeah, those are the dangers of playing that sort of game. But it was very very fine edges in oh. the Six Nations towards the end, both yes, it was. against Ireland and the loss to France. And you know, I think that that's the sort of rugby that. England fans want to see England now play. Oh, well, that may well be the case. Yeah. That may well be the case. And, and it you doesn't know, have to be 80 corner. minutes. It doesn't have to be 80 minutes. No, it what doesn't. It's want? got to be judicious. Why are Toulouse such a great side? Yeah. Because they can turn it on for 20 minutes and blow you away. A bit like some of those Northampton backs can and a few of the Bath boys with them for 20 minutes. You also a bit need like New Zealand. Up, you need to be able to truck it up like Pula on a muddy night at Ponypool Park. And Toulouse can do that as well. So you, you have to have both options, but England have to have that in their armory. And you'd love to see them, you know, just light the fuse for 10, 15 minutes at various stages during the game. Because I think that can really, that can wound New Zealand. They're not used, well, then no, that's not true. They, they, they Of course, they've coped with that in the past, but they don't, it's not comfortable. It challenges them. Mm. And you're going to have to challenge, you know, Eden Park down there, you're going to have to challenge them somehow. Guys, well, there, there are two been... elephants in the room here. And... I just want to discuss the Beno Urbano issue before Tom gets here because I don't want to bore him with that discussion. Um, first of all, would he have been in the squad had it not been for that red? And second of all, it raises the question of the 20-minute red card yet again, which I think now that we've had the last two Rugby World Cup finals, men's and women's, be not decided by red cards, but obviously the final has gone to the team that hasn't had a player sent off in the first half. And now the same thing again has happened here. But neither match was, or any of those matches, were remotely ruined by a red no. card. No, they they right. were made by a red card Dead in right. many ways. I, mean, so, no, I thought that was quite a harsh red card. Was he going headhunting deliberately? No, he was not. Was he actually going high deliberately? Not really, because he was a fairly short bloke. He was down low and he was tackling a, another short guy who was low and it was all very dynamic. This is the new era that, by the letter of the law, was a sending off. But I didn't think it was a bad incident. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that, a harsh law. But it's a harsh law, Brendan. I I, I, yeah. I get that. I don't yeah. think it's a harsh red card because it was, no, it was, it was a red card. card. Obviously, it was under a red the card. law. It was a red card, and he had a very good match. He and and, really well. and feel free to tackle somebody round the legs just once. Yeah, yeah. just once. Do a Sam Underhill. Well, I mean, I, mean, you, you, I mean, I'm I'm sorry for Obama. I do feel sorry for him. But you have to be seriously dumb. 
Oh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and you get Ben Kay and all those guys on the TV saying, well, the Bars Game Plan is all about winning the collision. Oh, God, I don't... I don't yeah, well, as you say, Underhill won the collisions and absolutely legitimately. The yeah. thing about Urbano is, is that he was always hitting up in that tackle. Always. Yeah. Always hitting up. So, you know, it's it was it was it was going to be a problem. I thought he played very well for the 20 minutes he was yeah. on. And yeah, I think that if he'd stayed on, they would, you know, I would have favored Bath to win the game, definitely. Um, but uh, and and he should, you know, he, for me, he would have been in the England squad. I would yeah. definitely have taken him. Yeah. So um, it, it's a it's it's a sort of lose lose uh, all round in many ways. But you know, the concussion, the, the the tackle laws are as they are at the moment. Now, this twenty minute red card, I'm not sure about. But um, you know, I suppose if they trial it properly, suck it and see, and if it really looks as if it has a beneficial impact, but they need to look at it very carefully before they introduce it. And it wasn't the game ruined. As if they are. It wasn't ruined. As per usual. (laughs) World rugby. I Well, I I mean, I'm in danger of getting the nosebleed here, but I'm with world rugby on this in, in, in the sense... Not with a twenty-minute red card. I see bags of problems first. because I know I, I have no particular faith in in teams not gaming the twenty-minute red card. Mm. I mean, you know, it is perfectly possible behind closed doors. I'm sorry, but it is true. And any of us who have played rugby at any level, my modest level, Nick's slightly better level, whatever, you know, blah 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 blah. <laughs> behind closed doors, if the other side have got an outstanding player on there. You can quite hear not all coaches or not all captains, but some saying, we'll take 20 minutes for the team. Get him off there. Yeah, yeah. Get him off there. Yeah. I mean, listen, that cynicism is writ large into the... It, it, anybody who, who knows the game and has seen the game over a number of years knows that that cynicism is writ large into the game. Yeah. Therefore, you legislate against it as much as possible as much and, as and, and also i mean mike, mike helwin um of, of the observer who's a who's a mate of mine and he's a mate of ours um and has done a hell of a lot of good work on the whole concussion question a hell of a lot of good work yeah. and he made the point he had his rant as, as i expected him to do on sunday saying the red card of obano does absolutely nothing to solve rugby's concussion problem and it the same. Because yeah. this is a, a cum, you know, the problems are cumulative. They're they're not necessarily the one off. And of course, Augustus didn't even go off for a for a um, uh, an HIA. Yeah. So, but world rugby in this environment have to be seen to be doing something. And all you can do, practically, unless you're going to stop stop taking everyone's try and legislate against all head knocks yeah. which you cannot do and still keep it as a game of rugby they have to draw a line somewhere and the line not unreasonably is the jaw down yeah and if you're going to smack someone in the jaw accidentally or otherwise you're asking for it. yeah you're bloody asking for it and and i'll tell you what what the most extraordinary aspect of it is is how long professional rugby players are actually taking to oh. make this adjustment. It's Don't. staggering. You Don't. know, you would think that the defence coaches would have got the message by now and that the players, and maybe the defence coaches have got the message, but somehow I'm, I'm, I question that, but that they would definitely make sure by now that the players I'm talking about, mm-hmm. that they observe the law as it is if they want to stay on the pitch. The Urbano tackle was a dynamic situation. Yes, both yep. players were moving at a kind of pace. Yes, yep. but there was no one else involved. It wasn't, by rugby standards, a particularly congested situation. It wasn't a second tackle where you had to avoid... No, the no double low. hit. He had clear line of sight, clear line of sight. And he still managed to whack his shoulder into his jaw. Well, top effort. Mm. And you're, you're, I think he's a fine player. I, I'm struggling to think of something more dumb. Your point, Nick, about how that. slow they are. I mean, I, I still can't get over it. If you've got Courtney Laws, if you've got Sam Underhill as the figureheads of tackling an English game, why would you tackle any other way? 
Mm. You know, it, it, it absolutely shames every other professional when you see those two textbook tackle after textbook tackle in the heat of battle. They can mm. do it. It's it's not rocket science. Do, do you know, the, the way they the think game. about it, Bren, the way they think about it, if, 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 the, if that three foot one Irish president, Michael O'Higgins, was playing rugby now, he'd find a way of hitting Devon Toner in the jaw. <laughs> reaching out like that <laughs> I mean but that is the point is obviously Courtney Laws is 6 foot 8 and he has no issue getting down low and Brendan, I think Brendan it was you that said Abano was a you know is not quite as tall a guy but obviously that's even more reason why he shouldn't be heading up one Augustus up there so no exactly um just before and, Tom, and also he was in I, he was in his own 22 augustus it's not also you were desperately trying to stop an offload that was going to cost you a try no no exactly he's, he's he's 70 yards plus from your own line why why would you do it <laughs> just a bit of um insight into why it's taken so long for players to start tackling lower so where i played my rugby last year and i'm not going to name and shame but you guys will probably know where that was um, we Eaton. were taught, <laughs> no, <laughs> not eaten. Um, we were taught as a two person hit, your first person hits under the armpit on one side, and the other one targets the upper shoulder. And those are your, those are your two points of impact. And that seemed like an absolute recipe for disaster. And I just wonder whether defense coaches, obviously, this was not a professional club, but that you know, it's they. The head coach coaches are one of the Nat One um, teams who have just yeah they're up. borrowing they're borrowing from top end absolutely you I know. think coaches have to take a huge amount of the rap here and it made me laugh a few months ago the crocodile roll was outlawed I thought it was outlawed four years ago when they started giving yellow cards for it but Christian Day friend of this podcast came in with a big tweet applauding it hang on a minute the crocodile roll doesn't actually exist it didn't exist until coaches rugby coaches. Invented it to get to the jackal. I thought There's crocodile roll was an Elton John song. Yeah, exactly. And you know the crocodile roll. That's when you used to get all those broken legs doing the judo practices in the England yeah. training. Yeah. The crocodile roll is from the players, from the coaches. It's their fault. You know, it's the um, game itself. Putting an end to Sam Jones's career. Exactly, but that's where it came from. The coaches. You know, yeah. and the Sunday somehow infer that this was the game. Had Listen, sort of I mean, it, this on them. the, the I double. Hang on, Nick, 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 Nick. Hey, well, Tom's uh, appeared. Tom has ah, appeared. Tom. Hello, Tom. Good morning, guys. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Good morning, Tom. Hi, Tom. How are you? Are you feeling yeah, good? Just about, just about finished celebrations now. So, yeah, um, yeah read right back to all my life. Oh, you didn't well, do I hope you're going to make some sense. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not at times, but I'll try my best. <laughs> Well, obviously, massive congratulations. Um, we were just discussing, you know, high tackles, crocodile roll, etc. We'll maybe come back to that in a little bit. But first of all, I want to hear about post-match Saturday because there have been a lot of pictures online um, of ski masks and goggles and Courtney Laws obviously came to the press conference shirtless and in ski. But just tell us about the celebrations. Yeah, no, it was pretty, uh, pretty hectic for a couple of hours, to be honest. Um, you know, the, the ski masks were, you know, there's been a, a lot of um, questions asked about that, but just to stop, like, champagne spray in the eyes, I think there's a, um NBA team that did it a couple of years ago. So, uh, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite a good idea, we thought. Um, but, yeah, no, it was, it, it was carnage for a couple of hours, you know. For me personally, you know, probably disbelief for a little while, took a, couple of hours to sink in um but but no it's great For, forgive my ignorance tom because i'm old but um ski 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 go i mean where 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 what what was the um what was the sort of theory behind um the whole ski goggle thing it's um i i, I mean i'm i'm just a little bit off the pace these days because um, you know my pension's about to come out so um uh but i i i i, I mean it was very picturesque um, quite striking, but I didn't understand the first thing about it really. So basically, it's mainly just because when everyone was show uh, spraying champagne in the uh, changing room just to keep it out of everyone's eyes, that's what um, that's what I was told. And I think they look pretty good as well. So Toulouse <laughs> did it as well after they won. I think they're everywhere at the moment. But if mm. you what, so obviously someone in the team has bought you thirty pairs of ski goggles or whatever. 
if you hadn't won, did the ski goal would just get put away? I, I, I assume so. Um, <laughs> I think yeah, they were. I think they were actually given to us by um, Sun God, which was very kind. But um, yeah, I, I assume they'd be sent back or um, you know put somewhere for potentially another day. I well, reckon, from the club's it, point it, of view, it, let's hope it's not all downhill from here. I I was going to say, I reckon it's health and safety at work. So make sure that nobody gets a cork in the eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly what it was. Um, and the post game parade that was the next day on the Sunday. Am I right in saying? Yes, that was on the um, we did the open bus in in Northampton. Yeah, right around the town. Tell us about that. Well, it was. It, yeah, it's really good. Um, I didn't know that many people lived in Northampton, to be honest, let alone the Saints fans. Mm. Um, there were yeah, crowds of people right from when we came out of the uh, came out of Franklin's Gardens, um, the people there, and then all the way into the, the market square. Um, you know, where we, there were a few interviews and stuff and we got off the bus and um, you know, met, met some of the fans and some family and friends. So uh, no, it was great. And you know, everyone we passed would just follow the bus. So there was a you know a whole load of people behind us just following it as well. So, uh, yeah, it was unbelievable day. Well, we were talking a few weeks ago about the scenes when Toulouse won the European, you know, Champions Cup and the following day, you know, 30,000, 40,000 people in Plus Capitol. And, you know, what an incredible rugby season that is. But Northampton is, is not far short in, in English terms, is it? That is a major, major rugby hotbed. And it's big wins like that that, that brings out the whole, the whole town, doesn't it? Is it a city, Northampton? I'm not sure, but... You know the rugby community there. Yeah, it's massive. I, I don't think there's um, on that. I don't think there's many clubs that that would be able to pull off that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, we're lucky in that sense. We have got such a big following um, and such a committed, you know, support base from the from the town. That was, uh, that was great too. Do you, do you get a, a sense of that in your day to day? Having come from somewhere like London Irish, which was a sort of peripatetic club, really. I mean, I mean, you you know, in tradition historically, it moved from place to place. Um, never, never really had a, a geographical heart, um, even though there was a big heart in the club, obviously. But Northampton must feel very different day to day to you. Yeah, it, it, it is a, um, a very much a rugby town. You know, there's um, obviously the Cobblers as well, but uh, the rugby club is is probably the main um, team in the town. And you know, you, you very often leave your house and. Um, see St. Kitts or little magnets on the back of people's cars and things, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's very relevant and it's pretty common to see uh, St. Kitts when you're out and about. I suppose Gloucester, Bath, Exeter would be the only obvious comparisons, would they? I mean, I mean, Le Leicester, your, your, your dear, nearest and dearest in Leicester, I mean, that's an extraordinary rugby city and or extraordinary sporting city in many respects because it's got top-end football and rugby, but but in, pu in pure rugby town terms, Northampton and those two or three others, that's about it, I would think, in this country. Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. Um, yeah, obviously London Irish, the, the fan base was great, but being in London, um, probably overshadowed by a lot of, you know, big, big, big sports, a lot of football clubs and things. So, um, yeah, probably not the, the same kind of feel, but um, yeah, like you mentioned, those four or five are, uh, are pretty similar. T tell us about the coaching, Tom. Uh, you know, a lot's been said about about Phil uh, Dyson and 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 Sam Vesti and and everyone associated with the coaching setup, um, and and they are they are the buzz at the moment. There is a lot of people talking about them as bringing new ideas, making something new out of out of Northampton rugby. Can, can you give us some sort of idea of the the sense of ambition and the sense of expertise you you're you're getting from those blokes? Yeah, I mean they're um they're, they're great for you guys. Very young for coaching team, um, which says quite a lot, I think, about them. Um, you know, there's not massive experience for, for behind any of them. You know, rather especially it's his, his first proper season in, in Union and and what a job he's done. Um, that's uh, Lee Radford, mm -hmm. our defence coach. Um, and yeah, Besties is yeah, it's so knowledgeable. Um, you know, some of the some of those large plays that we had on in the final um, that we were scoring in our second phase, and then we went through twice um, in the first half. Um, you know, that's kind of he's a massive man I know. Um and then yeah, Dallas ties it ties it together really nicely. Um got quite a personal um, connection with quite a lot of the players, guys he played with. Um and yeah, very very approachable guy and um someone you can definitely go to if if, if you ever need anything. 
That that can be a danger, though. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's a danger in Phil Dyson's case or Sam Besty's case, but there have been there have been times when people have moved out of playing into coaching and f- and just find that transition in the way that they're ex- they behave or the way they're expected to behave with the playing group. That can be quite a test. It, it, it's a it's, that's quite a delicate thing to get right, I think, because you can be too close to players because. Patently, you're going to be giving players bad news sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so there, there, there is a balance to be struck. They're obviously doing that quite successfully, in your view. Uh, I, I'd say so. Um, I, I think the balance is very good. Um, like you said, it's probably the same with the whole sport, to be honest. There's, there's always a time for, you know, a laugh and a joke. Um, and, you know, when you're a winning team, the environment's always going to be very good, but you know, similar when, when you speak to Dallas, there's, there's always a time that you can have a, a serious conversation with them. Um, whether that be stuff on and off the field, um, you know, and I, I feel like he gets that balance right. When you look at the final, uh, Tom, how how much of it um, didn't go to plan? Um, pretty much all of it, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it, it, as you as you boy tell it, it was, you know, not not our best performance by a long stretch, and you know, one of our worst of the season, which which is disappointing. Um, it, it probably looked quite nervy from the outside. Um, I think, you know, like like I mentioned earlier, those those two launches, those two um, moves that we had in the first half, probably got us out of a little trouble um, in terms of you know scoring points. So, you know, that was good. But you know, in, in terms of phase and stuff, we were, we were off it. Um, but you know, we are the best teams. They they find a way to win in those in those scenarios and those those time of games. So um, we we're very fortunate to, be able to get off the line. Um, a bit of individual magic at times, and uh, yeah, got us through and um, got us over the line. Was that nerves, Tom? Was that um, getting to the finishing line and and just you know, it's a big step to become champions, or was it Bath excellence? Who they they really fronted up defensively and you know um tackling wise uh obviously targeted Alex Mitchell and tried to disrupt the the, the fluid link I mean what what was I doubt if you've even had time to think actually in the last yeah. three days of yeah. why it wasn't so good but um what what are your thoughts now to be fair all credit to Bath they um you know they came with a clear plan like you said coming after Mitch um you know really coming off the line and, and getting out to outside backs not giving them space um, which, you know, probably rattled us a little bit in the first half and um, meant that we weren't able to get that go forward. Um, we are probably on the wrong side of the of the ref as well at points. Um, I think, you know, after you know, a team does get a red card, especially in a final, there's always that element of, of wanting to even it up a little bit. Um, so, yeah, you know, the Bath were, Bath were good. They were on it. Um, you know, we were struggling to get line breaks, struggling to... Um, to win collisions at times and they probably won the physical battle on the day um, but like I said a bit of, bit of individual brilliance um, and probably a little bit of luck at times across the line what, what, What's the messaging Tom when the opposition lose a player um, because a lot said that it is, it is you know there's a hell of a lot of evidence out there which suggests that good teams find playing against fourteen quite difficult that, that the disruption can be can have as bad an effect on the full strength side, as it does with the side that's lost the player. I mean, what, what's your messaging? I mean, instantly, do you say, "Look, they're really going to double down here. We're going to have to be. We're going to have to be better." Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's um, potentially subconsciously people think you know, off the gas, you know, that's it. We're playing against fourteen, but um, it was quite often quite the opposite. Probably galvanised Bath quite a lot. Um, and you know, apart from those two quick tries we scored afterwards, they were, you know, I think I, I think personally they, they stepped it up after, um, and you know, really, really stayed in the fight to be fair, and but with with fourteen guys, so yeah, it's just you've kind of just got to keep more of the same, and you know, hope they break down and hope that that, that one man advantage kind of, um, you know, lets you get a foothold in the game and 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 they break, which which they didn't in in all fairness then. Tom, I'm going to have to uh, say bye. I've got a dental appointment. I'm afraid. <laughs> um, very nice to uh, to meet you. Uh, all the best, and uh, see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Nick. What well a Nick. Tom, I don't know if you. I don't know how much of the game you remember, and I'm guessing you probably haven't had time to watch it back. But your two carries 
before your team's first two tries really seemed to you know get you on the front foot you ran over Cameron Redpath which must have been quite a nice feeling um was there a little bit of take the game by the scruff of the neck there and obviously you know you've come into your carrying as, a, as an asset to your game um just speak about that and whether it's stuff you've done in the gym to work on and things like that yeah I, mean, I've, I think especially for for those two plays it's it's obviously very important to the to the whole to the whole um team and the whole play that you know you get on the front foot there and that's quite a big job of, of the loose forwards um see it more and more with teams you know using their back row forwards out out on those set plays to you know, make yards and make a dem, um, and get and make defenders scramble for you know for that next phase. Um, and if there can be just one or two guys that have overfolded or underfolded because of the speed of ball, then um, that's going to open up space for us. So um, yeah, no, it's, it's very important. It's something we walk on a lot in the week. Um, me and me and Jarno Augustus as well have been, um, you know, sharing that load a little bit in the midfield this season. So uh, yeah, no, it's great that. I was able to get my hands on the ball and uh, and make a difference there. And the talk a little bit, uh, uh, you know, one or two, one or two great Northampton blokes have uh, have ended now. Um, I mean, obviously, Courtney, a hell of a lot's been said about him. I'd be I'd be interested to to hear your views on on what he's given you during your your time there. But also somebody like Alex Waller, who at one point played about eight million games consecutively for Northampton. He didn't seem ever to get injured. It's only in the last couple of years, actually, I think that he, he got a, an injury that kept him out of the game. I mean, he's been an extraordinary servant. Can you, you can you just give us some kind of inkling about what lies behind those two guys? Um, yeah, so Courtney, you know, he's a ridiculous player, someone who's probably just developed their game throughout their career. Um, which which not many guys do, you know. Early on, he was kind of that guy who was, who was smashing people, and I, I'm not saying he doesn't doesn't do that now, but that was probably more prominent in his uh, his performances then. Um, and probably more recently, he's become this like this guy carries a lot. Um, Jackler as well, you know, he's really added that to his game, um, which has been great to see and, and, and brilliant for us this season. You know, he's not not only just for getting turnovers, but but slowing the ball down um, and giving us set, time to set a defense has been. Um, great for us to, to watch him add that to his game. Um, yeah, it's been it's been so good for us this season. Um, and then yeah, Alex on the other hand, you know, he's been a cornerstone of the of the Saints pack for a number of years. Like you said, he's got some ridiculous records about you know consecutive games, consecutive appearances, you know, league league records, club records. Um, and yeah, that's just a testament to him and his um, professionalism, really. To keep himself on the pitch for that long to keep himself playing and rack up that many performances um, yeah he's a real leader in the team as well um, speaks very well and you know really really consistent guy that you can always rely on um, is he as annoying as he looked on the TV he's, he's, he's got that he's got that little it, it wasn't me gov half smile every time something happens he's got um, he's just got that little smirk on his face where you think mate you're a real you know you've got a bit of a a chances streak about you, young man. Oh no, he wouldn't be the first prop in history to have that about him, of course. But he does seem to be able to take the rough with the smooth quite easily. He seems to see the funny side of the game somehow to me. Yeah, he's. Um, I, I remember he was always a little bit of a pain to play against, uh, <laughs> but I was uh, Irish, and uh, yeah, he has got a bit of an old school touch about him, which is uh, which is good. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's ever present, and I'm I'm just glad I'm on his side now. Yeah, good answer. Tom, you, you got back for the, the final and the semi-final, but you had quite a, a big injury at a, a bad time um, this season. How, how sort of tough is it rehabbing and getting back? And how close was it to to missing out on the fun there in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it was, um, really struggled, actually. It was a, a bit of information on my pelvis bone, which um, quite a, quite a chronic injury has happened over time. And, um, yeah, it was... It was it was tough because I didn't really have a, a specific return to play date. Um, you know, I was kind of telling the lads, oh, I'll be one more week, I'll be one more week. Um, and I was kind of just having more setbacks. It wasn't improving that quickly, which um, was really frustrating. I'm missing some big games like Croke Park away against Leinster. Um, you know, that was a tough one to watch on the TV. Um, Probably one of those injuries you can't work too hard on. Is it rest rather than rehab? Or is it getting the balance was the, the main difficulty? 
but that was the thing it was it was trying to balance it and um just do things at appropriate times with appropriate intensity and not push it too too hard too too early um and yeah for me it was it, it was very frustrating you know Quinn's away at Twickenham it was my first my first game was Twickenham was on Saturday so um you know at that point that that would have been my first chance to ever play there um so that was a, that was a shame to miss out on as well um, but no, it was, it, it was lucky that I got back. You know, it was a game against Bath away about about a month ago in the last um, league game. So I came to the bench for that, um, which was probably my last chance to to play and put myself forward um, because I, I doubt if I was fit for the semi-final that I would have been picked with my rugby under my belt. So yeah, um, I was lucky to, you know, to play then and uh, and then play in the semis against Saris and, and, and luckily start the final. So it was great. And feeling good now, 100% or managing it a little bit? Uh, still managing it slightly, um, but you know, much better than we were, and, and we're in a good place now for to look after over this off season uh, and come back in um, flying in pre season. You, you, you've you've been like a, a duck to water at Northampton, Tom, and you know you're a big part of a of, a, of a, a champion team now, which is which is great. But and you're probably sick of being asked this question, but is the whole London Irish experience out of the system now? I mean, it's, it was tough. It was it was one that you know happened quite over a number of months, and and something I didn't quite come to terms with right until the end. Um, at that point, I was straight back straight into um, a pre-season with England, um, in prep for the World Cup. So um, I probably probably dusted and settled with that for a little while, um, and the England stuff did take my mind off it a little bit. Um, so you know, very very tough at the time, and in the same breath that. Um, that happened that, that Saints were very quick after you know we went into um, administration Saints were very quick and efficient at, at sorting me out there so I was very grateful of that um, and that was able to give me a good peace of mind going forward and, and, and going into England and you know concentrating on the on the next job which was as hard as it was um, it, it had to be done at that time yeah does this feel like obviously the start of you know your six years into your professional career now and the start of that career was the the sort of Saracens and Exeter era of the Gallagher, Gallagher Premiership does this feel and Saracens play a brand of rugby that's very different to Northampton and Bath's for that matter does a Northampton Bath final and obviously you guys winning and not only winning but winning playing the brand of rugby you've played all season does it feel like a start of not maybe the start of the Northampton Bath era where those are the two big teams in the nation that could potentially be at the top of the league every year for the next five, but also challenge um, on a European scale. But also, if you are going to compete at Gallagher Premiership level, you need to be able to play the transition into attack style of rugby that you guys play and have mastered this season, really. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's something that we definitely strive towards. You know, I don't think any... Any Prem team has, has won it twice in a row for for, for quite a long time now. So, um, to do that would be would be brilliant. And um, you know, it is all about backing it up now. Um, you know, we got a young team, um, guys coming into their prime now, losing a lot of experience. Um, this season, you know, like I mentioned earlier, Lutz, Sue, um, Courts, among others. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of caps um, leaving the club, but. Got it. I think we've got a young enough team and um, and guys are going to have to step up so, so that we can push on again. Um, so, no, is it exciting time for the fans tonight? I can't lie. Mm. Are you looking forward to competing with, obviously, Laws, go, uh, Courtney going, Lewis Ludlam going, new competition in the back row with the likes of Henry Pollock? Yeah, no, but he's a he, very good player. Um, he's he, very mature as well for his age, I think. Um, yeah, he's he's got a big future at the club, um, and uh, yeah, man, we'll probably probably be on that as well. So uh, yeah, it'd be exciting to see him in the mix next year um, and add a little bit different to the back row. I should have asked you about Lewis Ledham actually, Tom, because he he seemed to me that when when things when things weren't going all in Northampton's direction, he was he was an extraordinarily enthusiastic, sort of committed. You know, nuncial pass type of player. I mean, he was all action, massive energy. Sometimes in in real adversity. There. I mean, I had a lot of respect for Lewis Ludlam. I, I have to say, and I'm glad he got the England caps. He he did. Um, yeah. What what was your impression of him during your time there? 
Yeah, um, I'm be- loads unbelievable leader. Um, he's one of the the big voices in the team. Yeah. Um, speaks really well on a daily basis. You know, he's he's one of those guys like you said brings a lot of energy. Um, I can really really galvanize the squad. Um, so yeah, he, you know when he speaks, everyone listens. Um, he's not the sort of guy that repeats himself a lot as well. So uh, yeah, no, he's been brilliant for us in a leadership role this year and um, and player as well. He's unbelievable. You know, he's had a really successful in the career and um, you know for for him, Francis, the right move now. And I know he'll be did miss the Saints. Um, but you know what a player and what a servant he's been to the club. Yeah. Just very quickly about Bar. Um. One head-to-head that we previewed in last week's episode, we had Craig Doyle on, was yourself and Sam Underhill. Um, obviously, we've spoken about your performance and you're giving front foot ball. Sam Underhill put in a pretty monumental defensive shift. Just talk about how you were foreseeing that battle and then to see someone hitting people like that, what that says to you in terms of, obviously, he's an international seven who's done it, you know, a, 2019 semi-final against New Zealand lives in the memory as well. Just what you make of a performance like that? He was probably one player who didn't necessarily deserve to be on the losing side. Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a few jokes after that. Um, George Hendy probably should have given his medal, his win, his uh, <laughs> match medal to him. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, Anders was was brilliant. He's uh, all action guy. Like he's one, he's one of those guys. He's played a lot of international rugby now. Um, Still seems to be getting better with it. So, uh, yeah, no, some of the tackles he put on is huge. Um, you know, he he's all over the ball as well. There was, there was one breakdown I remember in particular where I thought I'd, you know, I, I thought I'd cleared past um, and I thought I'd won it and he's, you know, coming right almost underneath me um, and nicked the ball right under my eyes. And, um, yeah, no, he, he was ever on Saturday. Um, and, and, yeah, no, it was, it was really big for Bath and I think will be for, for a number of years. It's it's also good to see players um, revisit the heights after. I mean, he had a whole bag of. I mean, largely concussion, wasn't it? With with, with Underhill, but he. I mean, he's had a lot of. He's Shadows. had a lot of absence, um, and you know, he's been he's been written off a fair few times now, actually, by people who just not in any not in any um, ag- aggressive kind of way, uh, but just people who assume that we wouldn't be seeing much more of him because he was. You know, he was never seen to be around very much. That he had these recurring problems, and now he's back pretty much at the twenty nineteen level and before. And that, that's quite reassuring, I think, in today's rugby that people can get back from those absences and re- rescale the heights that they'd already been they'd already visited. Yeah, no, a massive testament to him. Um, he's had some pretty serious injuries and a few long layoffs, and like he said, to get back to the to the quality he was on Saturday. Um, you know, he, he he'll be big for. But England this summer as well, and um, and England going forward. So uh, yeah, it's great to see a guy like yeah, his quality back back in the mix. Tom, what what does a month off look like for you before you go back to free season? You got anything planned, or you do you want to rest? Do you want to keep active, or what, what what does a player do for a month these days at the end of the season, other than Las Vegas? I think um yeah, no no Vegas for me, unfortunately. Um, it was talked about on Saturday night, but uh, I didn't follow <laughs> through. Um, no, I think, yeah, I have a rest for the, for the first week or two, um, and, and, you know, just probably decompress and, and get away from it for a bit. I'm off to Croatia tomorrow, um, with, with a few mates, so, uh, that'll be good fun. Um, but at times, yeah, to relax and get away from it, and then, uh, yeah, we'll get back from there and, um, you know, probably start stepping things up again for, for, for next season, a bit of running and, um, you know, get myself up to speed. But, uh, yeah, but relax for the next week or two now. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'll watch rugby for a bit, which would be nice. Does pre-season ever get less horrible or is it just more horrible year on year? Uh, I think, yeah, pretty consistently horrible. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a tough period for, for any player. Um, and, you know, what one benefit before we get into the final is pre-season is a little bit shorter. Um, yeah. So that's that's always a bonus. Tom, one last thing I want to trouble you with. We usually do a 15 quick fire question section for our special guest. Um, and just got a little bit of time for that to finish off if you're happy to do that. It's completely off the cuff. I didn't send it to you before. Um, so if you're happy to do that, there's nothing too taxing. Don't worry. And then you can go and en- enjoy your holiday prep. 
Good, yeah, yeah. Ready when you're on. Nickname. TP. Best rugby memory. Winning the Prem. Nice. Most embarrassing rugby memory. Um, probably full mooning against Bale in the season. <laughs> Is that it might, have been, it might have been twice actually. <laughs> Is that televised? Not that I'm going to yeah. go back and watch it. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just get yourself some proper shorts. <laughs> Twitter, yeah, Twitter, Instagram, the lot everywhere. I didn't see that to be fair. Pre-game tune. Probably a little bit of. Um, uh, here comes the hot stepper. Nice. Post-game meal. Wagon mamas. Oh, interesting. Best player you've played against. Uh, Ibn Esther. Best player you've played with. Twenty dollars. Favorite player right now. George Hendy. <laughs> <laughs> Rugby idol. Uh, Jerome Kano. Nice. Favorite stadium. Stad Mail. Favorite gym exercise. Black pull down. Lap pull down, nice. Yeah. Occupation if rugby didn't exist. Probably a probably a chef. A chef, really. Yeah. You get to cook much of your own food. A little bit in the evenings, yeah. 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 Okay. Nice. What's, what's your go-to? Um, probably Batman carbonara. Nice. Superstitions. I don't, I don't have many to be honest. Rugby law, you would change. Uh, seat belt tackle. And lastly, best thing about working in rugby? Probably the constant crack you have with, um, with all the lads. Nice one. Nice. Thank you for doing that. Sorry for putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, I wasn't You're sure. Good. Oh, they, they were better answers than most. They were, 100%. <laughs> and a lot quicker. Than, I mean, Craig Doyle. About 25 minutes shorter than Craig Doyle's quick fire answers. Oh, here's <laughs> That's because really we weren't batting in, or rather it. it was because I wasn't batting in. That's yeah. Like, I, I think well, that's, yeah, well, that's well done, Chewy. Yeah, um, fair enough. Yeah. I know when to shut up. Yeah, no, you don't. Um, <laughs> on that note, Tom, massive congratulations again. Thank you for joining us. I know it's only three or four days later after the celebration, so we really appreciate it. And yeah, I hope enjoy Croatia and your time off. Cheers, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Thanks very much, Tom. Have a good summer. Hey, guys, take well care. Done. Congrats again. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day. <laughs>